Okay, let's uh, get started. Welcome everyone to uh, this lunchtime uh, Martin School Seminar. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Lorimer. I'm a, a professor of environmental geography in the School of Geography here at Oxford. And it gives me great uh, pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Nathan Sayre uh, for his talk today. Uh, Nathan is a professor of geography at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, and he's been visiting here for this academic year based in the, in the Martin School. Nathan's best known for his work on uh, rangelands, uh, an empirical focus on uh, rangeland science and rangeland management, and his conceptual analysis of how capital, the state, and science interact to manage and alter built and natural environments. He's the author of The Politics of, the, of Scale, a History of Rangeland Science, which was published by the University of Chicago Press in 2017. And today he'll be talking to the title, The Cattle Grain Beef Complex, Maize Feedlots and British Breeds in the Rise of the Modern Food System. Uh, Nathan will talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have time afterwards for uh, Q&A. Uh, but please join me in welcoming uh, Nathan to the stage. Thank you, Jamie. I take it it's not, okay. Um, thanks everyone for being here. It's a real pleasure and um, I generally want to express my gratitude to the Martin School and the School of Geography. It's been a, a magnificent opportunity to, to be here. And I want to share with you some of the research that I've done during my time here. Um, so I'll just dive right in. Um, if I can figure out, there we go. Um, I think it's agreed pretty, pretty widely that um, we have a lot of problems in our world these days, particularly environmental problems, and that food is at the center of many of these problems, and that the food system uh, is in need of dramatic transformation. Um, livestock and meat are often identified as uh, particularly in need of change or problematic in a variety of ways, and in many ways, beef in, is considered the worst of the livestock in terms of environmental impacts. So um, in many of these papers, thinking about uh, the livestock system right now, poultry tends to be a big feature of it. Um, I'm not going to talk about poultry. I'm going to talk about the origins of the feedlot. Uh, where did this intensive uh, landless system of uh, fattening livestock intensively on grain begin. And I want to draw some lessons from that history. Um, I figured it was appropriate to start with a passage from Charles um, and company. These two passages are just in, uh, put up there to suggest that livestock is booming and it's also unsustainable. Um, the first one says that more and more people are demanding more and more meat and yet the prices are going down which suggests some extraordinary phenomena. Typically, if demand goes up, uh, prices should go up as well. But it's not happening that way. And the second one is that a lot of the unsustainability of the system is about the, uh, the feed, about the production of the feed uh, for these intensive livestock systems. Um, so this is, again, I want to talk about where this began. And that means going to the Corn Belt of the United States. Uh, maize here, corn in the United States. Um, this shows you where it is. This is 2021 when the harvest reached 15 billion bushels for the year. And that was in addition to four and a half billion bushels of soy. Um, about 35, 40% of that corn was fed directly to livestock. Another 35 or 40% was uh, used to make ethanol. And a lot of the leftovers from the ethanol production were also used to, to feed livestock. Um, so this is one of the most productive agricultural systems in the world, um, and it's absolutely central to the United States food system and has been for a very long time. It's a very strange place. It's extreme in a lot of ways. Um, these maps show you first on the top left that it's some of the most fertile soil in North America. On the top right, you see that it receives more nitrogen fertilizer than almost any other place in North America. Bottom right, it uh, suffers from some of the highest rates of soil erosion in the country. And the bottom left, I, forgive me, there's no label. This is a map of farm subsidy payments. 
and the Corn Belt receives an enormous amount of uh, direct payments to farmers from the federal government as part of that subsidy system. It's also environmentally quite destructive. Um, the top left photo is intended to give you a sense of how intense the monoculture is in the Corn Belt. Um, Michael Pollan has suggested that this is actually urbanization in a sense, the density and the homogeneity of uh, farms in this landscape. This is a picture derived from uh, remote imagery to, to give you a sense of how thoroughly the landscape is dominated by crops, in this case, corn and soy. Um, it's an absolutely integral part of the feedlot confined animal feeding system, which will, this is where I'm going here with this. It's also a major contributor to uh, nutrient loading and water pollution and the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico uh, from the uh, combination of erosion and fertilizer use. So what I have come to call, I've come to call this a project of recovering the Corn Belt. Um, in the first instance, you might say what we need to do is get some kind of cover crop on that cornfield soil right there in that picture. Um, but more generally, more broadly, I'm interested in trying to recover a history here about how this came to be and draw some lessons from uh, why it became what it is. Um, ideally, I would hope this could have sort of nature recovery implications, that we might use it, use some of this knowledge to improve uh, biodiversity, protect the soil, uh, the water, the ecosystem services coming off of these lands. Um, I think there are potential socio and economic, uh, social and economic benefits here. This is an area afflicted by chronic um, poverty. It's been in a state of sort of recession for 50 plus years, if you think about agriculture in the United States. Um, and uh, to recuperate some insights from the past to help guide the future. And, and these are multiple senses of recovery. So let's start with what the system looks like now. Um, everyone familiar with this term, rangelands? Even Americans are not terribly familiar with this term. Right? And so these are landscapes used in their natural or semi-natural condition. The, the, the vegetation that grows there is simply allowed to grow there on its own and uh, grazed by livestock in most cases. Um, and the, the red is, uh, gives you a sense of the, of the dominance of rangeland in those parts of the country. Uh, immediately to the west of that, there's also a great deal of rangeland, but um, it's in many cases so dry that large, area, large areas may not be grazed. And then the black dots are the livestock. And you can see the, that the livestock are primarily concentrated in that central belt of the country on, on uh, pasture and rangeland, uh, rather than on, on the corn belt. And for now, um, that's sort of all we need to understand. But it, by implication, what that means is that the corn that's grown in the corn belt is shipped to find these cattle. The, these. Uh, so the, these are high, high CAFO areas, high feedlot areas, and corn has to be shipped to them. Cattle are actually born uh, and raised as calves around, around the country, all across the country, and, uh, and shipped also to these uh, feedlot areas, where they consume both corn and a variety of other feedstuffs. It wasn't always this way. If you go back 100 years, the cattle were, in fact, in the Corn Belt. And so were the, you know, the majority of the nation's hogs. They were all there together. The Corn Belt was actually a corn, cattle, and hog belt. A um, hundred years before that is when the feedlot was, so to speak, invented or devised. And this goes all the way back to the immediate post-revolutionary period in the United States. In the late 1700s, um, people began to uh, trail cattle from throughout this area, many of them semi-feral, up to southeastern Pennsylvania, where they would be fed over the winter, typically in barns, on corn, because there was tons of corn grown in the area, and fattened up, and then trailed to Baltimore or New York or Philadelphia and sold. And this turned out to be very lucrative. Um, starting about 1800, 1805, uh, a, a number of entrepreneurs from uh, Northern Virginia and Southern Pennsylvania took this model and went to Ohio. And they set up shop right in this area 
they borrowed a bunch of money to do this. Um, they knew from the beginning what they were going to do. They were going to take this model of corn and livestock and build on it. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Can I go back? No, I'll get to it. Um, what did it look like? It involved growing corn, which was a Native American cultivar and was extraordinarily productive and high. The yields were ex extraordinary. And then stacking it up, cutting it and stacking it up into these piles, which were called shocks, at the end of the harvest, after you know, letting it cure there for a little while, and then running large concentrated herds of cattle through those fields. And the cattle would sort of tear the pile apart and eat a bunch of stuff, both the stalks and the, and the grains. Um, a lot of it would pass through their system. You'd leave them in there for a day or two, according to the records, and then you'd pull them out and move them to another one, and you'd follow it with a whole bunch of hogs. And the hogs would root around in the manure that the cattle had left and consume the remaining grain, and then you'd pull the hogs out, and you would do this through the winter in a rotation, and then drive the cattle to market back in Philadelphia or Baltimore. Um, the hogs didn't drive very well, so people started sending them to Cincinnati. Um, this was extremely productive. It didn't require a lot of labor. And it was soon discovered that the uh, manure from the combination of the cattle and the hogs sustained the fertility of the soil such that you could keep planting corn every year. And this comes up repeatedly over the next um, 100 years, in fact, as people track this system and observe what, what's happening. It spread gradually westward with the settlement frontier. It was, in fact, the sort of main model of agricultural settlement spreading from Ohio across Indiana and Illinois and finally ending in Iowa. Um, beyond Iowa, the, the, uh, the weather wasn't well suited to corn anymore. Um, but by the 1880s, Iowa was at the center of this system. And this, this depiction from 1870 when, the, when Illinois was the center of the industry gives you a sense. You've got, you've got cattle and hogs and corn all together in these fields. Now, there's several things worth emphasizing about this system. First is that it was never a subsistence activity. It was commercial from the very beginning. Like I said, the people who started this actually borrowed money to go do it. They had every expectation that they were producing for sale in the market. This was not because they were going to somehow support themselves by eating the corn or the livestock. In other words, the livestock wouldn't have been produced in the absence of Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, the urban markets where the demand was. Second, it presupposed the overabundance of cattle, or of corn, I'm sorry. The corn supplies were so huge that the corn was worthless unless you fed it to cattle. It was not economical to try to haul it all the way to market, but if you fed it to the animals, then it would pay to, to, to get it to market and sell it. I've already mentioned the closed nutrient loop, and I'll come back to that. And then the la lastly, this is actually where the slaughterhouse, the modern factory slaughterhouse was invented as well. It was invented in Cincinnati, where they were killing three or 350,000 animals a year, pigs, uh, by 1850. Why is this not advancing? I'm stuck here. There we go. So this set in motion a westward movement, a re recursive pattern. You'd start by raising your own calves on grasslands and, and pastures, and then putting them on the cornfields in the winter. But eventually, the, um, the need to sort of maximize your returns would, would cause you to plant more and more corn and to get your calves from elsewhere, from further west, where they could be raised more cheaply, produced more cheaply. So, and as people moved in and as the, um, as the economy sort of continued to grow, land values went up, it was more and more important that you maximize revenue from your, from your farms. And so they would give up the production of calves and just specialize in corn and feeding. And here, and you can see in 1860, the animals are spread throughout that, uh, 
Ohio River Valley area, and by 1890, notice both that there's now this enormous concentration of cattle in the Corn Belt, but also that there are cattle scattered all the way across the plains. These are the uh, ranches that have been set up as the Native Americans were decimated, the bison were decimated and removed, the landscape was opened up and populated by cattle. Still not, oh, sorry. Um, the initial wave was lo Texas longhorns that were just found in uh, on the ranges of Texas after the Civil War. Am I doing something? Uh, this is the one that isn't working. Okay. Could you use this? Yes, that's what okay. I've been doing. Okay, thank you. Got it. Um, it was a kind of bovine mercantilism, basically. You went to Texas, you rounded up a bunch of Texas longhorns, you trailed them north, and you sold them, and you could make a great deal of money in that period between about 1865 and 1873. Um, but the feeders, the, the corn farmers who were feeding these animals, soon discovered that they didn't fatten very well on corn. And they were hard to manage, they were kind of wild. And they didn't pay the way uh, other breeds of cattle could pay. And the slaughterhouses and butchers soon stopped uh, buying these Texas longhorns. They weren't interested in them. And so the farmers and the ranchers both had to make a change. This was also when Chicago, the Union Stockyards were building out and you know, getting bigger and bigger and bigger and funneling all these livestock through their slaughterhouses and on to, or their stockyards and their slaughterhouses and on to the East Coast. And they had uh, an interest in animals that were uniform and would yield the kinds of cuts of meat that would uh, give them the most return in the marketplace. So they were also pushing for a change. And this is where um, the British livestock breeds very rapidly overtook, either directly or by crossbreeding, the herds scattered across the Western Plains. Now, these were animals that required large, reliable, nutritious feed. They had been bred here in this country on the, on the sort of foundation laid by agricultural improvement, fodder crops and intensification that enabled the breeders to feed them sufficiently that their other traits would manifest and um, enable them to make decisions about how to select. By virtue of inbreeding to stabilize the breed, they also achieved conformity, which worked better for factory slaughterhouses. The goal right from the beginning, beginning was the acceleration in the fleshing rate to make them grow faster, to make them more efficiently convert this rich feed into meat and to do it as fast as possible. In both countries, I believe the argument, it's worth thinking about the ways in which this altered land tenure because you needed fences and control over space to control breeding. Um, that's a longer story that I am happy to get into in Q&A. But these were animals that thrived on corn. They did even better in the United States on corn than they did over here on fodder crops. And they yielded the beef that urban and British consumers had come to demand. And by 1900, age at slaughter, how old the average animal was, had dropped from about six years to about two and a half and the weight at slaughter had gone up significantly. So you've got a dramatic change in the um, conversion of feed into meat. In the Corn Belt, what this helped drive was that complete conversion, that complete plowing up and loss of native prairie um, in the name of growing corn to feed all these animals. And the number of cattle in Iowa you know, increased by a factor of 100 over the space of 60 years. On the rangelands, the Great Plains, what this meant was that first, the influx of these British livestock, British breeds of livestock, happened very quickly in the early 1880s at a point when um, a lot of capital from Britain and, and New York and Boston were, was being invested in these ranch operations. A lot of ranchers had a lot of money that they'd borrowed to buy these animals, and they drove the price of the animals up so high that breeders in the Corn Belt actually started shipping their cattle west onto rangelands rather than to the Union stockyards. And the numbers ballooned, and then there were storms and droughts, and this is a big part of what's known as the, um, the sort of 
the demise of the cattle boom, the collapse, and you can see the kind of die-offs and destruction that resulted. It also came to be that the subsequent sort of rebuilding of the ranching industry in the United States, including the policies that were written to, to regulate grazing on public lands and the science that grew up to, to study how to manage rangelands and livestock, um, took these British breeds to be the sort of baseline animal. It took them to be what all cattle were like and designed all kinds of interventions such as fencing, predator control, you know, kill all the wolves, kill all the bears, um, artificial water sources and supplementary feeds, issues of grazing distribution. They were all treated as just an intrinsic part of trying to raise livestock. When in fact, even today, animals that have been in these landscapes for more than 100 years, those breeds still now graze in ways that are different from other breeds of livestock. And this has gone sort of unnoticed in the history of range science and, and rangeland management. So now what happens after World War II? This is kind of a abrupt shift. Um, I imagine this is familiar to many of you. After World War II, um, there is synthetic fertilizer available. It's incredibly cheap because the munitions plants that were built for the war effort are basically turned over to fertilizer corporations. Um, farmers are suddenly given access to very cheap synthetic fertilizer. Hybrid corn comes along, and a few decades after that, hybrid sorghum. Uh, these are seeds that can produce at much higher rates and take advantage of that um, fertile, you know, fertility from nitrogen fertilizer. You see an incredible growth in the overall U.S. corn harvest uh, beginning about 1950 and also an incredible rise in the use of nitrogen fertilizer. Um, the way it's been portrayed in the, in the literature, this is treated as something of, of an issue of simply having enough supply, that there, were no long, there was no longer enough rangeland um, to raise all the calves that were needed, and there was um, demand, post-war American prosperity, demanding more and more beef, and that shifting to confined animal feeding was therefore necessary to meet consumer demand. That may be true, but it's also quite clear that in the absence of such um, massive synthetic fertilizer inputs and corn overabundance, again, that this also probably would not have happened. The consequences of this have been quite dramatic, and this is a huge part of the problems with beef um, that we started with, right? Um, in the 1950s and 60s, those corn farmers in Iowa stopped raising, stopped fattening cattle at all. They just turned entirely to corn and soy, and the, the cattle instead spent, were fattened off the range directly to feedlots. And you see that the size of those feedlots has steadily increased, and now there are feedlots out there that are um, 80 to 100,000 animals at a time, and quite a few that are 40 to 50,000. Farmers, therefore, had to rely on synthetic fertilizer because they simply didn't have livestock anymore to provide manure. Um, pr overproduction continues to afflict farmers uh, in, the, in the area. The water pollution, issues of um, pathogens in feedlots, all these problems unfold from this. Now, that's not news, and but there is, a, the other side of this is the efficiency gains associated with these, um, these feedlots and these intensive systems. Um, these maps depict greenhouse gas emissions and emissions intensities from ruminant production in different parts of the world. And you can see that in the United States, um, even though the production is very high, the intensity of, C of greenhouse gases per kilogram of meat is extremely low compared to much of the developing world. And this is because, primarily, the animals live much shorter lives and they feed on much richer nutrition. And the breeds, they are of breeds that have in fact been you know, selected precisely for this type of uh, man-made environment, you might say. So it's not surprising then that we get questions like this one heading up uh, studies, right? Um, 
the efficiency means lower emissions per output and makes it look as though from a climate point of view, you're better off producing meat this way, assuming that you need the meat or want the meat, right? Um, or we have to consume less. And in the politics of the food system in the United States, that's not a very popular position to stake out. Um, there's this sort of hard trade-off then between the, the industrial system and the alternatives. Um, integrating livestock and crops is a topic that some scholars are interested in and are pursuing. And they're studying and they're debating. Um, converting the Corn Belt back into prairie and then grazing it with livestock is sort of one proposal that scholars have put forward and there are debates about exactly how that might affect output and things like that. Um, and there's also some research uh, here uh, trying, to th trying to think about, well, could we get all that fertilizer or that manure from the feedlots and get it back out onto the fields where the, where the, the crops are grown? And that's you know, also a possible uh, way of improving this system. But it, as far as I can tell, the original feedlot, the feedlot of the Ohio Valley in 1840, which persisted in, in principle anyway, up until the 1930s, maybe 1940s, a system in which the farmers are self-sufficient in the, in the nutrients they need to sustain the soil in their fields because of the use of livestock in the fields um, is, is nowhere to be found. I have not seen any sort of analysis of this scenario, um, perhaps because it's just not familiar to people. Um, it could have dramatic effects in all sorts of ways in terms of water quality and soil health, and um, but it would allow you to maintain some of the efficiency of feeding with grain and yet not rely on the synthetic fertilizer inputs. Um, and these are just some, some passages from the literature. I have yet to really see a systematic you know, study of this from the time. It would be interesting to try to learn more. And I think it would also be very interesting to try to figure out what these farmers did. How, you know, I, I've found just descriptions of how some people were very good at it, some people weren't so good at it. I think there was a lot of local knowledge or, or traditional ecological knowledge sort of unsystematized, but nonetheless important that would be interesting to try to recuperate. Um, so I hope that's novel and potentially exciting to you. And um, again, thank you, everyone. Thank you to uh, Charles and Jamie, um, the SOGE and Martin School and Sasha and my colleagues um, in New Mexico who are, who are working on this to some degree. Thank you. Great, many thanks, uh, Nathan. We have, we have plenty of time for, uh, for questions. Just raise your hand, and I know we have people uh, also online. Uh, just a reminder that we are recording the talk, so uh, as you pose your question, uh, consider that it will be recorded. Um, we have two questions here. Would you like to go first? Sorry. Maybe, maybe wait till the microphone comes, sorry. How do you solve the problem of um, methane, you know, in the, in the uh, down with cattle? Right. This must be a big problem. It, yeah, that, that is an unavoidable feature as of yet. Um, and my understanding is that the, the amount of methane you get from a, a steak or a, an animal is, in the first instance, a function of lifespan. And that um, animals that only live to be two years or a little more than two years old uh, will have a much uh, smaller uh, total output of methane than any animal that lives four or five years the way that they do in many parts of the world. Um, and it's also a function of, of feed and feed quality. And there are there's efforts afoot to um, figure out how to reduce methane by changing the composition of the gut or the diet. Um, but this, this would not necessarily alter what we have right now in any like huge way. Um, so yes, you still, have the, you still have the methane. And it's, again, it's a question of, well, either you have the animal and you have some methane, or uh, you have to get rid of the animal altogether to avoid that, I believe. 
Hi, um, you haven't mentioned alfalfa. I thought that was a component in the feedstock. Um, it is. It's, uh, I think much of the alfalfa, maybe most of the alfalfa grown in the Western US is either for winter feed rather than finishing feed, or it becomes a component in finishing feed, or it gets um, sold to, you know, either exported or sold to uh, support uh, sort of barnyard animals or, or horses. Um, I, I, I don't know for sure how much alfalfa goes into feedlots, but I don't think it's a huge part. It, it commands a lot of irrigation water in the interior west, and that's its biggest uh, impact uh, ecologically, is that it's extremely thirsty. Just a point of clarification on the greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah. Um, did the um, figures um, for feedlots also include the greenhouse gas emissions from the food production? Yes, I believe yeah. they do. Okay. Yeah, just, yeah just those, those life cycle analyses have, you know, they yeah. do capture that. Thank you. Um, we have a question online from Andrea. She said, you mentioned there was so much corn around in the 19th century and people built, therefore, a business model feeding it to cattle. So the question is, why was so much corn grown in the first place before the meat craze started? Uh, I mean, in the case of the Ohio Valley, the corn was grown to feed it to the cattle. Like, the meat craze was already there motivating it. And there is one interesting wrinkle here, which is that the other profitable thing you could have done with that much corn was make whiskey. And that's, in fact, what later did happen. But it just so happens that um, the Whiskey Rebellion provoked uh, a punitive tax to be placed on whiskey production at just the moment when people were settling in, in places like Kentucky and Ohio. And whiskey was actually not an option economically at that, in that window. And the livestock, therefore, got all of it. Um, but the abundance was also just a function of the incredible soils and the, and the sort of incredible nature of, of maize um, in those soils. They, it just, it boggled the mind um, for most of these, you know, immigrants uh, coming from places like, like Britain, the, the yields you could get with this crop um, and sustain. Question here. You, you left us hanging with your last slide, I think, on closed loop yeah. systems. Um, I mean, my understanding is that there are quite a lot of farmers out there right now who are operating in that mode. So 100% grass-fed beef, um, as an example, um, uh, with no um, external inputs or very, very little external inputs uh, could be argued is sort of getting towards yeah. a carbon neutral situation. Where is your, you, you mentioned, you know, it's an area for study. Uh, is yeah. that something that you are going to pursue? And um, if so, what, what, what are your actual plans um, in that regard? Um, it's a great question. I am not, um, I, haven't, I haven't gotten there yet, and I think I need help to do that. Um, in the United States, the number of grass-finished beef operations on rangelands is actually quite limited. They're, it's growing, but it's still very much a niche market. Um, not surprisingly, there's been a bunch of research comparing the environmental footprint of grass-finished versus grain-finished beef. And the evidence thus far on the whole suggests that in terms of things like greenhouse gases, um, in fact, you, it's, a, it's a net loss. There are more greenhouse gases per unit of output associated with grass-finished than grain-finished. And so this question of climate and livestock um, is getting a little fraught by those, by those findings. I, I, I would love to see more grass, and you're right, that would be a closed loop system that um, would be uh, 
would achieve the same kinds of things, if not more so, um, especially if you also could bring back sort of native uh, prairie and range vegetation. The question of whether it could scale up uh, is sort of a big, huge question. And what I see here is not some kind of like, let's do this instead. It's this could represent another way of achieving the nutrient loop, closing the nutrient loop, at least in large measure, without going all the way to a grass finish system that might be less productive and more greenhouse gas intensive. Um, does that, I mean, figuring out the, the parameters or the potential here, like how much could you gain in terms of greenhouse gases, in terms of nutrient uh, application, in terms, because you still would have to think about these animals are being removed. Um, will you really be able to sustain that soil fertility uh, in the long haul? And effects on output and therefore prices. I personally think it would be good if the price of beef went up and if the supply of corn went down. And it would be good not only for the larger society, but for the farmers themselves. Um, chronic oversupply of corn is, has been the, the bane of Iowa farmers for um, 100 years. And anything that would curtail that um, overproduction would probably be, re allow them to reduce the subsidy payments they receive as well. Um, we've got a few more questions, so maybe we'll move on. There's one, one at the back there, and then two over here. Great, thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, what do you think is needed in terms of shifting away from these sort of you know confined feedlot systems, and if, if it's desirable, you know, like what's what do you think would be required in terms of changing subsidies for farmers in terms of shifting to that more mixed livestock cropping system? Uh, wonderful question. Um, the policies to encourage less fertilizer use, policies to encourage diversification, which might involve unwinding policies that encourage this kind of single crop intense uh, production. Um, there's so many different ways in which, you know, one might hope to achieve this, but somehow they, you know, there've been very little success um, in despite, you know, decades of efforts in, in the policy realm. Um, I think if we sort of made an announcement that we were just gonna wean ourselves off of fossil fuels um, on some fairly accelerated rate schedule and sort of put it back on everybody who uses fossil fuel derived inputs to find a solution, um, that might basically back people in this direction. Um, the, in the States, the, the political sort of block and the lobby that protects this massive overproduction of corn is so powerful. Um, and cheap food is so politically powerful as well. Um, I, I hesitate to suggest that I've got some brilliant insight. Um, at this point, I'm just hoping to maybe provoke some interest and some study. And I, I personally would like to go try to find some 90-year-old Iowa farmer whose grandfather did this and try to find out how they did it, because I don't think it was easy. Um, building on your response to the last two questions, um, does basically, oh, sorry, what was my question? Um, if we shift from intensive to extensive, and that results in a decrease in output, I think we can all agree we need to be eating less meat. But I think the question is, if there's a drop in supply and therefore an increase in price, inevitably the burden will be on poor people to eat less meat. And so how do we reckon that with a, a, a just transition? Yeah. Another good question, and I, I don't have a great answer to that one. Um, the, uh, the, the rates of meat consumption in the United States are so much higher than they are in the rest of the world to start with that, uh, yes, the impact is, the distribution is already uneven by income um, quite significantly, and this would shift that perhaps further. 
I, I personally am more concerned in the end of the day with the, the availability of protein to people in other parts of the world who don't have this kind of oversupply. And it's interesting that like a lot of development work proposes that they should intensify livestock production to reduce greenhouse gases in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, right? I, I, I hope this kind of thing can help at least give people a, another way of thinking about this um, in which the, um, the, it's not simply a question of like going all the way to confined feeding and intensification or somehow keeping everything unchanged from um, earlier models. And the equity questions are gonna be there for sure. I mean, maybe just one question before we move to the next yeah. one. We heard a little bit about the movement of British breeds into the US, but what were the other global flows that matter here in terms of the inputs of feed from other parts of the world or the export of beef, or was this very much a kind of bounded US story? Um, at the time, Britain also was actively developing a similar supply chain from Argentina and South America, and that became extremely important as well um, and had some similar effects uh, as far as initially capitalizing on grasslands, excuse me, and eventually transitioning more and more to crops as feed um, for fattening livestock. And that transition, in fact, continues to this day. And in the meantime, the main Great sort of international grain flows today are much more, uh, well, the corn is a huge part of it and the U.S. is still a major player in that trade, but soy is now a huge part of it and a lot of that's coming from Brazil and the source, the destination for a great deal of it is China. So the, the geography has changed. At the time you're, you're alluding to, 1870 to 1900, give or take, um, it was about investment capital coming this way and uh, wheat and beef going the other way. And it was uh, you know, simultaneously tied to um, a kind of British imperial market uh, that extended into Egypt and India and other parts of the world as well. Um, but the, the beef element uh, was pioneered in, in the US. And um, Harriet Friedman and Philip McMichael's uh, sort of food regime theory identifies 1870 meat, wheat, U.S. expansion as the moment when this sort of comes into, sh uh, into uh, its modern form of um, sort of global trade, a sort of geopolitical order organized around um, the international trade in, in bulky staple foods. Um, yeah. um, are you considering how AMR would factor at all into this more traditional feeding model with cows or cattle on the move um, and defecating in a variety of areas and then that making its way into a broader environment? AMR means? Antimicrobial resistance. Ah, uh, oh, yeah. oh. Um, I mean, the antimicrobial resistance problem, I would think, is most pronounced in, in confined animal feeding. Um, so I, I'm, I hadn't thought about that. Um, I, I see that as, if you could diminish the reliance on these confined animal feeding operations, hopefully that, that on balance is a, is a step in the right direction with respect to that. Um, does that answer your question or not? It sounds like you had something further in mind. Yeah, I was thinking it could actually maybe do the, the opposite um, because if it's confined in one place, you have a like source point, like a different point source of pollution, whereas if it's just meat, you have this I see, I see, the I see, I see. I, I don't know the details there. I mean, my, um, this is, this is premised on the idea that the cycling of the manure into the soil is sort of takes place within certain bounds, so to speak, right? That it's, it's sufficiently thorough that the nutrients actually do end up in the soil and don't go downstream or just um, oxidize into the atmosphere. Um, as for possible pathogens in the manure, I don't know whether that would also be handled by some, but this is where I think the, the practices, the knowledge of the farmers at the time who, who achieved this would be really interesting to try to reconstruct, right? Because it's not easy to put a bunch of cows in there and then put a bunch of hogs in there and have it all turn out hunky-dory um, when you go to plant again in the spring. Sasha, you look like you have something well, to say. Can I ask you a question? Uh, sorry. 
aren't really fed, um, they're, they're, they aren't fed subtherapeutic doses really in that. I mean, I think that is, is more of an issue in poultry and pigs. I'll just leave that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it also kind of touches on the manure topic. So this question is maybe based on the fact that I don't know a lot about feedlots in America, but more how agriculture happens here around beef in Europe. If cattle is raised really far away from where the, their feed is produced with synthetic fertilizers, and you saw uh, you showed the maps with like the density and the, the, just the size of these feedlots, where is all of that manure? Where where is it going? Is it in any way utilized? Do people only see it as a waste product that is not utilized in any way? Because at least in Europe, it plays a much bigger role getting the manure back into the field somehow. But here, yeah. the distance of where the field is and where the cow poops is just so far. Yeah, no, no there's no um, expectation that it can be returned all the way to where the feed was grown. Um, there is, There are a variety of ways in which it's put to some use, um, although it's also it's also in many places still a you know, there's these giant lagoons full of manure, and they if, if everything goes perfectly, then sure you're like sort of taking care of the problem. But if they if they collapse or um, you know there's still issues there. Hi, yeah, thank you for that. Um, a few of us in the room are working on or thinking with uh, regenerative agriculture systems, which which made me think about, you know, the conversation between that and your idea of this, you know, closed loop. Um, and we're thinking a lot about it in cycles, um, yeah. particularly metabolically. Um, and a part of that is the different breeds. So I wonder if you could kind of bring into conversation the, the different breeds that you were talking about um, yeah. in the middle of the presentation with this idea of the, the closed loop system. Um. I mean, as far as the closed nutrient loop, mm -hmm. I don't have any reason to believe that the British breeds versus the Texas Longhorns were significantly different in terms of, you know, how did they metabolize corn and, and uh, fodder of various kinds. Um, in terms of what's, you know, the, the question right now, for example, um, whether there's a way to kind of balance, for instance, um, breeds that deal better with semi-arid conditions in the West and don't graze unevenly and hammer riparian areas and things like that, um, and still get the beef, the beef qualities that you need to sell into the market. Um, there's promising research going on in New Mexico where they're crossing these Spanish-descended um, heritage breeds called Criollos with, with British breeds and then fattening them and the beef turns out to be just fine as far as the marketplace is concerned and the animals uh, are somewhat smaller, they're less um, impactful on, on rangelands. There, there it's not so much about the nutrient loop though. And so, yeah, I'm not quite, that's a good question, whether there's a, whether you could breed uh, or work on the, the so many, breeding is so complicated and there's so many things that can be achieved with breeding if you know what you're doing and put enough effort into it. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe there could be improvements made precisely in that space, um, but I don't know the answer to it. Um, Jemima online has asked, one of your figures showed the US as having a much lower kg CO2 per kg protein emission than places like South America. Yeah. Can you explain why the US has so much lower CO2 per kg meat emissions? Is it purely um, because it's more intensive um, farming or are there other explanations? My understanding is that it's primarily age at slaughter and next is feed quality um, and breeding is part of this as well. The, um, the animals in the United States are basically, <laughs> they, they never experience a shortage of food and they never stop getting bigger and they reach slaughter age um, very, very quickly. Um, and their feed it tends to be very high quality um, compared to say, you know, tropical grasses or uh, African shrublands uh, forage. And 
that's what achieves it. They, they, get, they get really big really fast and they die really soon. And so per kilogram of output, um, they just don't have enough time to emit the amount of greenhouse gases that, that cattle in many other parts of the world emit. Um, also online, we have had a question from Molly. Um, I'm hoping you understand what it means. Wondering about how to undo and or lessen harm of the CGB complex and oh, how yeah. much problem is cultural as much as economic and technological. Um, so uh, cattle grain beef complex, how to unwind it or reduce its impacts. Um, how much is it cultural? How much is it economic? I, I would say it's economic and at this point political uh, because of the entrenched political power. I mean, cheap food is good for everyone except for farmers and ranchers, basically. And, and there are so few farmers and ranchers left in the United States compared to the population as a whole that their political clout is just not particularly um, significant. Um, unwinding it is, is something I, I, I think it would take a huge suite of policy interventions to unwind it. This might be one piece. Um, try to reduce fertilizer input uh, reliance. I mean, it's interesting, there's actually a great paper by a group of scientists from across the country's um, uh, sort of ag research stations, you know, attempting to define what the goal might be for a, a vision of sustainable intensification in the United States. And <laughs> their conclusion ultimately was reduce off-farm inputs. If you can reduce off-farm inputs, you, you will, in all sorts of different ways, in different places, um, you will help the farmer because they won't have to spend so much money on these things. You'll help the environment because these inputs tend to be damaging. Um, it's, it, it doesn't keep you from using tools, but it encourages you to reduce um, those, those things. And this is, I think that's the way, if you had to put it in one sentence, that's how you might do this. Reduce off-farm inputs and then let the, the combination of the market and um, individual farmers and ranchers figure it out. And so I've got one more online and then I'll come back to the room, sorry. Um, so Alexandra has asked, as there is an abundance of corn um, as crops, is there anything else you could grow instead of corn? Anything else you could grow instead of corn for the purposes at hand? I, I believe corn would be at the top of the, anybody's list as to um, sort of the uh, density of the nutrients achieved for the inputs utilized. Um, I mean, I didn't mention, but it's obvious, I think, to most people in the room that we now have so much corn that the cattle can't even eat it all. And you have to make ethanol and you have to make high fructose corn syrup and you have to do all kinds of other things to sop up the surpluses in the United States. Um, you have to ship a lot of it overseas. Um, as far as growing other things, I would love to see a more diversified mix of things growing on the land in the Corn Belt, um, including prairie grasses. Um, Corn, I'm just suggesting, could still be part of the mix. Thanks very much for your talk, Nathan. Uh, I'm thinking about dairy and, and the extent to which the story you told there uh, pertains to dairy systems as well, and, and, and relatedly whether the British breeds that you described were, I think they were primarily for meat, but they, were they also yeah. mixed dairy meat animals? Or, how, how, yeah, how does that story track? Um, yeah, I, I haven't. I haven't tried to find out to what extent dairy was part of this picture. There were dairy operations in Iowa as well, but they tended to fade out as these uh, corn and beef and hog operations took over. Um, they're regionally significant. Um, the breeding question is interesting because most of the breeds that were here in 1700, um, to the extent that they were breeds rather than just sort of the local stock, um, they had been valued for both dairy and beef, uh, and actually beef was secondary to dairy and traction in a lot of ways. Um, and the, the breeding of these breeds, in fact, um, reduced the, the milk output of m most of them. And then other people bred dairy animals that produce a great deal of, of milk. Um, and there's some funny stories about, you know, efforts that went wrong in this, in this space as well. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, I haven't spent much time trying to understand dairy as such. Obviously, some corn is fed to dairy animals, and some dairy animals end up in the beef supply, getting fattened at feedlots. Um, so, in that sense, they they intersect. Um, 
the dairy industry has gotten so concentrated in the United States, or, or massified, I guess, the scale of dairy operations has just exploded, and smaller scale dairy operations have disappeared off the landscape just in the last 30, 40 years. Um, so that piece of the story is really all about that. Thank you. Um, in this country, we've been seeing a fairly significant decline in meat consumption for a variety of reasons. And I wondered, is that, uh, are you seeing any of that in the States? And what do you see for the role of, in the long term of uh, artificial proteins? Um, first part of that question, the, I believe it is the case that meat consumption has leveled off in the United States, or at least beef consumption has leveled off. Um, it's you know obviously also still at a high level, um, but it's not growing the way meat consumption is growing in many other parts of the world. Um, as far as the artificial meats, I have I don't consider myself expert in this, but my impression is that um, they're not likely to become a huge part of the system soon, and they may or may not uh, you know actually achieve the full suite of environmental benefits that some people. Um, ascribe to them. Uh, in the meantime, I think, I mean, I, I guess I'm, I'm kind of sympathetic to the small livestock producers scattered all over the world who still actually represent two thirds of, uh, of beef production um, and who in fact do use their animals for manure and fertilizer and do use their animals to consume crop residues. Um, and they're also having a hard time with it and artificial meat in that context feels like so I don't know, so science fiction and, and off to the side that I, I, yeah, I, I'm not optimistic, I guess. We've got one question and then we should probably okay. call it to... Well, we've got to let Sasha ask too before we're done. Okay, and Sasha. No? Um, there's been a lot of conversations today about corn, and I know that Pratha Ranch in Northern California finishes um, with grain, but not with corn, so is there a way um, that we can grain finish that doesn't involve corn that would provide mm. better benefits for um, cattle, obviously, you know, stop uh -huh. antibiotic resistance. And uh -huh. um, is that a way that like ranchers in the process could like maybe directly sell to the slaughterhouse instead of yeah. you know, cutting out the feedlot in the process? Right. You said is Prather Ranch? Yeah. I was unaware that they finished with something other, or there's no corn in their rations at all. Uh, what do they as use? Far as I know, this summer, that uh, they, they don't they huh. don't finish with uh, corn, but they finish with grain. Interesting. Okay. No, I'd love to I'd love to learn more. Um, I was unaware of that, and um, Sasha may know more about it. <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess I, that gets into the question of like, well, how damaging is the corn compared to something else in terms of all the other dimensions of the of the process. And in certain parts of the country, I would imagine that, yeah, other crops would be a better choice, um, especially if you're getting into areas with irrigation and groundwater pumping and things like that. Um, but I don't know, I don't know how they do it. Um, the cutting the middlemen out and allowing ranchers to capture more value is a fantastic idea. And a lot of ranchers have worked hard to try to make it work. And some of them have found some success, but it's, um, it's been, it's very, very difficult. And partly it's because the efficiencies of the feedlot are so great that the marketplace is extremely unfavorable to anyone who's not taking advantage of those efficiencies. And then the, the shortage or absence of small scale processing plants is, um, is notorious as an obstacle for this. Thanks, is it, is it okay if I ask one? Yeah, so, um, I hope so. I yeah. think what, what jumps to my mind is that kind of questions around biodiversity and what does this do for kind of in the land sharing, land sparing kind yeah. of debate. Um, Cause that's something that didn't come up that much in the talk, but is a yeah. huge feature obviously. And it touches on, you know, relates to kind of overall production, but also to this major question, you know, the sort of twin crises around climate and biodiversity. So I'm, I'm wondering if, if you have any further thoughts around yeah. the biodiversity benefits yeah. of these kind of smaller integrated approaches, yeah. in, especially in the North America context or yeah. um, places that have natural grasslands as well as confined feeding. Yeah, that's a great question. And 
I, mean, I think it's worth emphasizing that in terms of the sort of homogeneity, the uniformity of corn and soy across the landscape in a place like Iowa, it, it wasn't 100%. It, it's gotten worse in the 20th century. It got worse after 1970. It got um, the sort of fence row to fence row philosophy. And I guess from a biodiversity point of view, first of all, if you can get rid of the chemicals, that will have various kinds of benefits for wildlife and hopefully um, biodiversity. If you can diversify the landscape and, and allow there to be more um, variety in the vegetation and um, if you could put buffer strips along the creeks and allow native vegetation to grow there, if you could um, allow, give farmers a, the margin to not plant 100% of their acreage, like literally all the way to the fence, um, and, and create just more edge habitats and, and um, connectivity of different structural vegetations, uh, vegetation structures, that all I hope would be of, of benefit. And I, th I mean, a hundred years ago, most of the farmers in Iowa still had large gardens. They still had multiple different crops going on. Um, and that if they weren't so forced to grow as every last bushel in a kind of chase for breaking even, um, I think that would open up a little room for the kinds of uh, sort of landscape scale diversification that would be of benefit to biodiversity. Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, so the three sisters, yeah, so corn, climbing beans, and squash used yeah. by indigenous tribes, yeah, in North America. Um, obviously, it doesn't really speak to the scale that we would need, but just in, in terms of biodiversity. Yeah. And I know the climbing beans capture nitrogen, which helps fertilize naturally. So yeah. yeah, this other idea of like what other kinds of crops could be planted in that closed loop yeah. while also still being feed, I guess, for cattle, yeah. which is something I was curious about. Yeah, I don't know as much about that in the Native American context as I would like to. My understanding is that that was much more um, the case, much more widely or intensively practiced in slightly more humid areas further east in the United States rather than the Great Plains. Um, the, I mean, yeah, some kind of polycropping system that would um, provide better ground cover, provide <clears throat> you know, presumably there are ways you could do that that would also be useful for this type of um, sort of shock-based feeding. Um, yeah, it's a great it's a great suggestion. Whether whether climbing beans and squash are the the other pieces that would be most useful, I guess is is not something I would have any idea how to answer. Thank you, Nathan. I thank you. We're uh, we're up on time, but thank okay. you all for your questions. And um, yeah, just join me in a. Final round of applause. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you.